it's a very emotional thing for my people. A lot of our people won't talk about it. it it's really scarred our families for three, going on four generations now. And every time someone would speak up and say something about it, it was always said, leave it alone. One day someone's going to come and show us where our little ones are at. story was obviously been slowly pieced together here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. But meanwhile, in Texas, it had never been forgotten. And every year, the Lipan Apache memorialized all the lost ones from Remolino and other massacres. And included in that are, of course, Jack and Cassetta, whose names are not mentioned. They are the lost ones. These two children are Lipan Apache living on the Texas-Mexican border with their family, with their band, and at, this is the time when there's massive expansion of the white population into this whole region, and so there's a whole series of forts built by the U.S. Army to protect the settlers. But when the Lipan Apache were raiding across the border and often withdrawing to the Mexican side, Ulysses S. Grant gave Randall McKenzie permission to go across the border, to ignore the Texas-Mexican border, to make raids on these Lipan Apaches. And the most memorable one was when Randall McKenzie went across the border and essentially massacred a whole band when the um, warriors were away, and so it was basically women and children. And this is known as the Day of Screams. And the children are actually hidden by their mother in some bushes where they're found by the soldiers who think that they're the only survivors. And the children are then taken in by the family of one of the bandsmen in the 4th Cavalry. And for three years, they travel around with that family. So they never return to their own families and they never see their own people again. But they are semi-adopted by the Smith family, Charles and Molly Smith. And we know that from a surviving photograph, which is the beginning of the piecing together of the special story of these two children. Because in 1991, Celeste Sorgio, the granddaughter of Charles and Molly Smith, Celeste Sorgio wrote to the Cumberland County Historical Society and sent a photograph of the two children, who at that time were called Cassetta and Jack Smith. And it shows the children in their Sunday best, and it's dated March 1880. And that photograph was perhaps taken as the last memorial for these children before they were forcibly removed and sent to the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Written on the back of this photo is, it says, um, Cassetta and Jack Smith. And then it says underneath um, that they called Molly my wife, and it's obviously written by Charles, Mama. So it sounds as if they had found um, some kind of a home with this white couple. 
They moved to the Carlisle Indian School. Cassetta is a little bit older than Jack. He's a, she's about 13 and Jack is about 10. The photograph taken at Carlisle is more difficult to date, but it's a very similar time period because the children look almost the same age. So we can match the two photographs and say, these are the same children. These are the children that left Kansas and came to Pennsylvania. When the Carlisle Indian School was founded in 1879, the very first groups of children to come came from the Rosebud Sioux and Pine Ridge Sioux reservations. And then other Plains groups came in. Uh, this was in October of 1879. By the time the school closed in 1918, there were over 10,000 children who came through uh, the Carlisle community and lived at the Indian school. Children were typically enrolled for a period of three to five years. Oftentimes they would re-enroll. And you know, if you look, if you look at this sea of children behind me, I mean, these children came from virtually every nation. So if you imagine a map of the United States and parts of Canada and Puerto Rico and just span across that map, starting with Alaska natives and mission children from California, Blackfeet from Montana, Crow, Assiniboine, Hidatsa, Mandan, Chippewa. You had Anishinaabe kids from um, Michigan, uh, Midwestern states. You had Six Nations kids from New York State, Mohawk, Cayuga, Oneida, Seneca, um, Tuscarora. You had Abenaki from Maine. So, you know, just imagine all of the 550 federally recognized tribes. They all were represented at Carlisle during that era. So the very first groups of children to come didn't speak English at all. And the purpose of the school was to assimilate them, to try to get them swallowed up. You know, there were these very violent metaphors that Richard Henry Pratt, the founder, used to describe this process. Um, he, he used the um, analogy of Christian baptism. He said, we like to take these children and hold them under until they are thoroughly soaked. And when, when they come out, they will be so-called civilized. So that was the goal, to take these children who came from almost uh, hundreds of different cultures, language groups, spiritual ways, and, and change them, transform them into carbon copies of their European American brothers and sisters. The clothing is removed. Some of it goes down to the Smithsonian. Some of it is, uh, just disappears. The hair is cut. And of course, because the children are inside and also because the lighting of the camera is used very skillfully, the children look much paler, much whiter in the after pictures. So you can see before your very eyes the civilizing process visually translated in these portraits. There are no pictures of what Cassetta would have looked like in her Lipan Apache dress because she had already been with the Smith family for three years and the same for Jack. But of course there are students who arrived straight from the reservation and who had been dressed in their very best clothing and who were wearing all their regalia, full regalia when they arrived, as a kind of honour for their leaving, and who then, of course, had photographs taken in their school uniform. So the contrast is dramatic. Cassetta is, for the Carlisle Indian School, almost the ideal student in many ways because she's totally deracinated. They wanted to break the, cult the contact with the traditional culture. Cassetta comes with that break already made and so she's included in a lot of the photographs that are taken and she's also one of the many children that are featured in a postcard. It's a photograph that's turned into a postcard which is entitled Our Boys and Girls. It's part of a commercial series that's sold by the school where the, the heads of the children who have had their portraits taken in their school uniform are placed on a single postcard or um, slide that's then sold. So she is one of our boys and girls. She's very much at the forefront in the early days of the school because she arrives 1880 and the school's only been running 
for a year. Cassetta. Cassetta was in had wounds on the front and back of her shoulder and the side of her neck. And when they asked how they got them, how she got them, she told the story that her mother had tried to kill her in order to keep her from the American soldiers. And this, of course, is interpreted as an act of savagery by the Carlisle School rather than an act of desperation by a mother trying to protect her daughter. Cassetta would have lost her family when she was around 10, so prepubescent. But when she came to Carlisle at around 13, she would have been exactly the age when she would have had a very important ceremony for her, the Apache puberty ceremony, where she would have been honored as a woman and the wisdom of women would have been given to her and shared with her and she would have taken her place in the family as a Lipan Apache woman with all that knowledge. But instead, instead of the beautiful um, garments that she would have worn for that ceremony, instead Cassetta is put in the school uniform and she learns to march and she learns to drill and she learns to read and write rather than the traditional wisdom that might have been hers. Um, after Cressetta passed away, this little boy ended up in the Carlisle community and, and literally was the baby of the school. On his f application form, it's listed that he is tribe Lipan Apache. So here is the child of Cassetta, who is supposed to have had all Indianness eradicated from her, who is now being given a tribal affiliation of a group he's never met. And he's actually not even going to quite remember who he is or know who he is later on. So he's sent to the Carlisle Indian School, much younger than any of the other students. By this time, Carlisle is taking students off the reservation who've been through the schooling system, so a higher um, level in the school and are older. So he sticks out as very unusual. He became like the mascot. He was the mascot at the school when he was arrived because he was the baby. There were no other Indian children who were four years old, so he was already called the Carlisle baby. There is a big silence about what has happened because of the pain and because of the um, extraordinary dis cultural and psychological disruption it's caused. So some of the communities carry these stories, others there's been a huge silence and it's the grandchildren of the students who are returning to find out about their grandparents. One of the most remarkable things for me as I was dealing with the written record and the photographic record was learning that there's this other record that's carried on through four generations that carries this story down the generations and doesn't allow it to die. We have to tell the story from the other side, the other side being the spiritual world, being the world that most people call heaven, the other, you know, we reach into that world to tell our story, to bring it back. Our people cannot move forward until our lost ones are sent home. And then I said, with prayer, and do certain prayers that I'm going to do. And then the final act will be to spread the ash and to lay rock and walk away. Then from that point on, I give prayer maybe, and my prayer is going to be that come tomorrow on the anniversary of you being taken from your people and from our people and from our families, that we ask the Creator to open the door and let her in. Sit down. In August every year, our families have always met. And uh, we've always set an empty plate out. And, and that's so we won't forget. This year's family reunion will be, we won't put the plate out no more.
last thing you give is something living when you walk away. You leave something, something that has passed on. Something you leave and return is something living. So that the spirit doesn't get mad when you leave. When you turn your back to it, you don't look back because it keeps, uh, it doesn't, you don't, you're not enticing that spirit to come follow you. You're telling him, we've buried you, you're now gone, but when we're in return for our sadness, we give you something greens that you may grow and you may bring yourself into that life.